Hi, this is Wayne Osgood, and I'm here with Del Elliott at the uh, 2011 ASC meeting in, in Washington, D.C., and I have the honor of talking to Del for a while about his career and uh, life and interests and all that. Um, Brendan asked me to start by saying a little about uh, Del's background, to sort of set a context for this, um, and the sort of things he's accomplished over the years. Um, Del got his BA from Pomona College in 1955 and went to uh, the University of Washington for his graduate studies, getting his PhD in sociology in 1961. Um, he started his career at San Diego State College, as it was then, rather than university, right, Tom? He had just gone to being a university. And uh, was there from 61 to 67, at which time uh, he moved to the University of Colorado in Boulder, uh, where he still remains. Um, he's written eight books and I'm not sure how many articles. Um, in his early work, I, th I think he was well known for contributing to strain theory, particularly looking at uh, dropout from school and how that strain might explain uh, relationships there. Um, and uh, he also developed the first of the major integrated theories, I think pointing the way toward Perhaps we could get some mileage out of taking concepts from multiple theories to build something bigger. And I would uh, venture to say was the most influential of the integrated theories. Um, he conducted the first um, national self-report study with a nationally representative sample, the National Youth Survey, which um, Lord only knows how many uh, articles there are built on those data. It was a, a national study specifically focusing on delinquency with lots of measures of uh, major concepts from the theories that had not really been implemented before. Um, he's been a leader in, in interdisciplinary work, bringing criminology and delinquency theory um, into the, the fray with people from various other fields, particularly was a part of the uh, MacArthur Network on Adolescence that led to um, a lot of developments I think that have been really productive across the social sciences over time. Um, and he has also been a leader in um, bringing evidence to bear on um, programs, particularly uh, violence prevention programs with the uh, blueprint programs that um, he has led and is still going on. Um, interestingly, Dell retired from the University of Colorado from his normal faculty position in 2004, but the one thing he in a sense has not been so good at his staying retired because he <laughs> remains very active and in, uh, just this year um, uh, two major uh, grants have been funded for his centers um, that will continue until 2016 so I think there's a lot more to come. Um, so anyway that's a little context setting and from here out it's mainly going to be uh, Dell talking. Um, I thought it would an interesting place to start might it be if you just said a few words about um, where you grew up and the kind of setting that was, neighborhood, family, those sorts of themes. I grew up in a, a little community which was close to East LA in Southern California, mm -hmm. uh, a place called Montebello. Uh, and I was there up through uh, sixth grade and then we moved into Orange County um, to uh, a little, another small little place called La Habra. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father had an orange orchard uh, there, okay. so I, that's where I actually that's where I first started learning Spanish, because we had uh, uh, you know Mexican workers that would come and pick the oranges, and so I got to know them pretty well. We did a lot of talking, so it wasn't very good Spanish uh, in a lot of ways, but that was you know where I started uh, my first exposure to that language. Um, so grew up there and worked uh, in both in orange orchards and avocado orchards as a mm -hmm. kid. Right. Um, and then graduated from uh, Fullerton High School and then went to Pomona College, which was um, where I got my, my BA degree. The Oxford of the Citrus Belt. <laughs> right. Great, it's right. great, great uh, school. Yeah, it's a great liberal, liberal arts college. Very interesting. Well, uh, it's really interesting for me to hear. I grew up in San Diego. My father mostly grew up in Lemon Grove working in the citrus orchards too, right. so that was uh, something I was around a lot as well. Um, 
how did you become a criminologist? Did you start on that track when you were at um, Pomona, or is that something that emerged later? Uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's kind of a hard question for me to answer. Um, I think I made some early decisions um, that, that I really was interested in the social sciences, and, and I'm not sure that there was any um, you know, early childhood kinds of things that led me in that direction. It's an area that I just found interesting. Um, and because of, um, of being interested in it, um, you know, I began to pursue it. So when, when I finished at uh, Pomona, um, you know, I had an opportunity to go several places. I was thinking both about becoming a teacher, um, and, uh, but I had an opportunity with a special scholarship to the University of Washington um, with an opportunity to work with George Lundberg, who at that point was you know, a pretty famous sociologist, a positivist. Um, so I decided that that looked a little more interesting to me, so I went to Washington um, and into the sociology department. From that point on, it was very clear to me that the interest in criminology grew because of a faculty member there, Clarence Schrag, who became my mentor. Mm -hmm. And he just brought this alive to me. Mm -hmm. He had worked uh, for period of time uh, as an academic, he'd taken some time off and was a deputy warden at the Walla Walla State Prison in Washington, came back with the, all the experience of being in the, on the firing line, working actually in that kind of a context. Um, he had great stories, great insight. He was, uh, he taught me a lot about theory uh, and my interest in criminological theory really it was a follow-up I think, to Clarence Schrag's interest and work. But I became a criminologist because of Clarence Schrag. Uh, and he made it exciting uh, for me. Interesting. Yeah. So how does his approach to criminological theory compare to yours? Well, you know, what's interesting was he was, he was primarily interested in the structure of theory, not a particular theory content-wise, mm -hmm. uh, but thinking about the structure of theory how you uh, create a theory, how you evaluate a theory, um, and different kinds of theoretical approaches. So I didn't come away with a particular uh, theory, but rather with some understanding about what that means, what a theory is, what the components are, and, and, and what, uh, what constitutes a theory as composed to a hypothesis or some pretty vague kinds of uh, ideas. Um, so it was that approach to theory, I think that yeah. was a help to me. Interesting. Um, the question I have here, which I think is a pretty interesting one, um, were there any biographical connections that you can point to between your research agenda and uh, growing up and early years in the field? Well, I guess it would not, you know. Um, there isn't one. That I, <laughs> that I can think of, mm -hmm. because I wasn't a, a particularly delinquent kid as a, growing up. Uh, I was a pretty conforming, conventional kind of kid. Um, so it wasn't as though I'd had experience, um, you know, with the justice system early on that led me to become interested in that. Um, so I don't, I can't think of anything. I've thought about that a lot, but. I can't see anything in my early growing up mm -hmm. which pointed me in this particular direction. I think it had to do more with what I found interesting, what kinds of things um, you know, excited me in terms of the intellectual development that I was going through, um, and, and I, didn't, I don't see any connection. Mm -hmm. There may be one, but <laughs> it's not one that I'm aware of. Right. How about um, within criminology, um, and beyond, your focus has been primarily adolescence, maybe transition to adulthood to some degree. Um, what's drawn you to the, that side of the field rather than others? My sense of that is, particularly when I was going through graduate school, that the real exciting theoretical development that was taking place was all in the juvenile area. It was primarily, you know, Cloward and Olin's work had just come out, um, you know, when I was there, and Albert Cohen's work. Those were the dominant theories when I was going through school, and those were really theories about the onset of criminal behavior during uh, adolescence. Um, and from my perspective, that's still true. 
I think the major theoretical models that we have have been developed around juveniles. They have early on focused primarily on the onset question. Just recently we're getting into the questions about uh, the sustainability of that uh, into the adult years uh, and termination issues are now uh, critical issues for us. But back when I was going through uh, my early graduate training, it was all of the theoretical work, the exciting research that was being done was in the area of juveniles. And that's what I was drawn to, largely because of my early interest in theory. Very good. Um, let's see, you've talked about uh, Clarence Schrag as a major mentor. Are there any others that you would point to? Uh, folks who have influenced you a lot as um, either while you were studying as a student or in your early years working in the field? Um, later on, when I, when I came to uh, Colorado, for example, um, I had an opportunity to work and become a colleague with Dick Jesser. Um, and he clearly um, is, is a mentor for me, you know, intellectually. Um, also a person who is very much interested in theory. Um, and sees uh, research, um, you know, really being directed and guided uh, by theory. Um, so he, I think he played a, a critical role um, in the later parts, uh, mm -hmm. stages of my development. The, another thing which I look to as having had a, uh, two other things which had a major impact, I think, uh, are not specific individuals, but the opportunity to be on an NIMH review panel on crime and criminal careers uh, and working on that panel. I was chair of that panel for several years. But with that kind of a collegial relationship with a small number of people who are working in the same area and those exchanges did several things for me. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about research there. And it also provided an opportunity that I felt that, that allowed me to be on the leading edge of research looking at the research proposals coming in, seeing what people were doing, seeing what the new ideas were, seeing the new developments, both methodologically and in theory development, um, was a result of being on that panel. Uh, and that was early in my career. So I, I saw that as a huge factor in guiding the way that I thought and the way that I uh, conducted research. About when was that though? Um, gosh, that had to have been um, I think that was probably in the mid 80s, maybe mm -hmm. 84, 85. Mm -hmm. um, that was early in my career. <laughs> right. Um, the second experience that I had that, that had a profound effect on me was I was on the MacArthur Network on Successful Adolescent Development. Mm -hmm. This was later in my career. And there was the first real interdisciplinary right. exposure that I had. Um, and it was an interesting because we had a clinical psychologists, we had developmental psychologists, we had sociologists, we had demographers, we had physicians, we, you know, we had a very wide range of different disciplines. And the, the, the interesting thing to me, it took us almost a year of meeting on a fairly regular basis before we had a common vocabulary. Before we could talk to one another in ways which everybody understood. Mm -hmm. And so there are some real obstacles to doing interdisciplinary research because, at least back at that point, um, we kind of talked a different language. Even concepts which I thought were fairly well fixed uh, in criminology had different meanings for somebody in the developmental right. psychology. Um, so this was a chance to work with some really outstanding people. Al Bandura was on that, Jackie Eccles was on that, Arnold Samaroff, Tom Cook. Uh, Frank Furstenberg, Dick Jesser, um, you know, these were uh, outstanding yeah, first rate uh, folks. people yeah. who were already very well established in their careers. And so the opportunity to work in that setting uh, and to be able to be funded to do a research mm -hmm. which was a true interdisciplinary effort um, I, I was another major turning point in my life. And how, say a little more about what the format for that group was like. How often did you get together? How long did it last? What sort of uh, uh, projects did you work on? Right, it was, um, now this was in the, uh, I think probably mid 80s as well. No, this was later. Uh, and on that 
um, on that network, uh, the idea was when we first started that this was called um, a, a network on successful adolescent mm -hmm. development among high risk youth. So it meant that we were, from the very start, committed to doing a couple of things. One, it was a focus upon success and not upon failure. Mm -hmm. And so much of my work before that, and a lot of it since, has really been upon delinquency and, and drug use and kids who are failing mm -hmm. in some respect uh, to have a healthy, uh, uh, productive uh, life course development. But this was an attempt to look at how kids make it. And the second focus was upon high risk conditions. So this was a, a kind of a whole different approach for me. It was looking at kids who are living in disadvantaged neighborhoods, families, uh, school uh, settings who managed to make it. And our thought was that if we could understand how it is that kids who live in disadvantaged contexts manage to grow up successfully and make it become productive adults, that would give us a lot of information on how we could address these other problems. Um, but the primary focus was on promoting success right. rather than avoiding problems. Uh, those two things are obviously related, but it's a different focus. Mm -hmm. It's a different focus. Um, so we met over a period, I say probably five years. And during the course of that time, we mapped out a number of different projects. Mm -hmm. Um, so, the, my focus uh, on that was on the neighborhoods. Frank Furstenberg, Jackie Eccles, Arnie Samaroff were focusing on the family. Tom Cook was focusing upon the school because we were interested in looking at the multi-contextual influences on kids that were at risk. Um, so we developed common measures, although uh, the focus in my work was going to be on the neighborhood. We were going to be looking at families and peer groups yeah. and schools as well. The same is true with Frank, whose primary focus is on the family. So they had many, many measures of family functioning and dynamics, which we didn't have. That is because that was their primary focus. But they would have some neighborhood mm -hmm. stuff as well. So we worked this kind of collaborative relationship across the different social settings in which kids grow up. Um, and we mapped out um, our focuses on neighborhoods so we had the full development of neighborhood characteristics. And the one that was on the family had the full development of the family and, and smaller, um, smaller levels of measurement committed to the other context. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we were looking then at neighborhoods, families, and schools. Right. Um, and there were uh, published results that came out of uh, that. So we had a book as well as several articles uh, that was published which was called Good Kids from Bad Neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, Frank um, Furstenberg and that team published a book on, on families living in, uh, again, in high-risk neighborhoods in Philadelphia. Uh, and Tom Cook was working on a school um, uh, in Prince George's County, and there have been oh, yeah. several articles, but he, the, the book never right. emerged right. Uh, from that uh, particular. So that's the way we were organized, but the, the times we met, we worked through common measures so that we could do some cross-comparison. Um, that was a real advance at that point in my life, yeah. uh, and my first real exposure to an interdisciplinary context. Interesting. I, I suspect that through you and through the other people you're talking about, there's a lot of spread of themes to the separate fields that most of us reading that work and being influenced by it don't really realize how bridging uh, those projects were. They were. I, I mean, I see a lot more themes from adolescent development, from um, family sociology and so on, in the field that I would guess came from those kind of endeavors. That be, that average author now, five years into their career, doesn't doesn't have any idea. Right. I think that a lot of those things are taken for granted now yeah. and, and are just a part of our current current way of thinking and theoretical orientations. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a time in which we talked a lot about interdisciplinary research. Right. But there was very little that was really done. Um, most often what was happening is that, you know, people would come together on a grant 
uh, and it would be called an interdisciplinary grant. But you would handle the socio sociological yeah. stuff. I would handle the psychological stuff, and there was no integration. We would mm -hmm. just each, we would each have our own measurement space on the interviews or the surveys or uh, whatever. Uh, so we worked side by side, but there wasn't any integration. This was a genuine integration, right. where we agreed on concepts and measures and the, the overall organization and thinking about development and mm -hmm. what was really involved in adolescent development. The times I've been involved in endeavors along those lines, sometimes it kind of hurts, but your head hurts coming out of you. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I've gone through the process of feeling like, why don't these people understand anything? And come out trying to, uh, a year later, with that as part of the way I think, and trying to convince other people of things I thought were foolish to start with or, or lacking. We went through some doozy arguments about concepts mm -hmm. and ideas and what was really going on in development and what, was what were the critical kinds of events and circumstances and the life course paths. And this, of course, was right when whole, the whole new life course developmental perspective was, right. uh, and that, that paradigm uh, was being proposed. Uh, right about the same time, I mean, this, yeah. that clearly wasn't present when we started, but by the time we ended, that, uh, you know, this uh, well, Glenn Elder uh, was, on, yeah, was right. on the panel as well, so that's a part of, you know, we were getting that from Glenn as well uh, on that you know, kind of life course development. So those, all of those ideas were blended and merged together in the work which came out of that particular MacArthur panel. Yeah, that's a fascinating thing to be a part of. Um, pick up a question from my sheet here. Um, what would you say are the major topics evident in the work produced over your career? You know, I, if I look back on my career, I think um, there are several things which characterize it. One, from the very beginning, I was committed to longitudinal research. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of testing theory with cross-sectional data did not appeal to me. Uh, the idea of being able to locate um, uh, temporally cause and effect, mm -hmm. uh, and as stipulated in those models, seemed to me to be critical because in my very first study, which we did while I was at San Diego State, we were looking at dropout and delinquency. They published a book on dropout and delinquency. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was the conventional wisdom that one of the reasons dropout was such a bad thing was because then kids fell into delinquency. Well, it didn't turn out that that, that was what we found when we looked at those uh, two uh, outcomes uh, longitudinally. Because at least in that study, most of the kids who, were drop, who dropped out were delinquent before they dropped out. And their being delinquent was a part of the reason that they dropped out because in many cases they were kicked out or pushed out in part because they were difficult kids to work with. Um, so knowing the developmental timing of those kinds of events turns out to be critical. So I, from the very beginning I've done almost totally longitudinal studies. So um, that first study which was an NIMH study on delinquency and dropout was the first of them and then the National Youth Survey mm -hmm. after that we're still doing the National Youth <laughs> Survey um, so a very very long long uh, panel study um, so so that I think was one of the concerns um, the other was clearly on adolescence um, and looking at uh, early on, just looking at onset, trying to understand what differentiated between those kids who got caught up in delinquent behavior and those kids who didn't, or at least didn't get caught up in serious forms of delinquency. Um, so those were early, I mean, there's a critical point we'll come to where I think my whole career changed uh, from this, what I would call basic studies of etiology. Right. Uh, into a very different world. Uh, but all of my early career was really focused upon testing theory, longitudinal studies, um, and you know major uh, kinds of research projects. Well, let's move on to that big switch. The big switch came um, in uh, the early 90s um, where I started doing some work with the Carnegie Corporation on Adolescent Development Group, 
Um, and I chaired a couple of workshops um, that, uh, that they were sponsoring looking at youth violence. Um, and out of that came an opportunity. They, they offered um, me an opportunity to set up uh, what is now called the Center for the Study and Prevention of Violence. They set up three centers. Um, the first one they set up was called Mediascope. And that was a center that was designed to work with the, with the film and uh, television industry, mm -hmm. trying to change the messages around violence that are being promoted in a lot of the television and film uh, industry. Um, and the a second uh, center they set up uh, was set up to work uh, with those people who are practitioners in this field, who are actually on the firing line working mm -hmm. with kids who are struggling with these kinds of difficulties and these kind of problems and families that have to deal with that. And then the third center was this violence center that we set up, which had as its primary focus trying to translate research findings into practice and policy implications. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been really on that research side of this with the National Youth Survey work, uh, you know, primarily. Um, but this was different now. It was um, taking on the responsibility of bridging the gap between the research community and the practitioner policy-making communities. And there is a huge gap. These, these groups don't understand each other. To this day, mm -hmm. there's still, I think, big gaps in communication across those, uh, those, those three groups. Um, so the idea for this violence center was to take on the responsibility of trying to take basic research findings and translate them into practice and into policy implications. And maybe that doesn't seem like a big switch, but it really was. I had to start talking to reporters and to the staffs on, um, you know, congressional, state, uh, national, uh, congressional staffs. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to affect policy, you have to be able to talk to people that, as a researcher, I didn't have much interest really in mm -hmm. talking to. So that was a huge change for me. Uh, it meant uh, a, a change in a lot of the writing that I did. It was no longer writing for professional journalists. Uh, it had to do with, with writing very brief kinds of things which would go to, to legislators and to staff on legislators mm -hmm. talking to reporters. Um, that indirectly led into this whole interest in the kinds of programs which are effective in preventing yeah. or uh, interrupting um, involvement in, in violence. Um, so that center was established in 1992 uh, and is still, uh, still going strong, um, was a major change, a uh, turning point in my life. Um, we still did a couple of waves of the National Youth Survey after the center started. Mm -hmm. I was involved in a couple of waves, and then essentially I turned over the continuing work on the National Youth Survey to Dave Heisinger initially, and then to Scott Menard. Um, still am involved in, in, in those um, surveys, those national surveys, but not in a central way. Uh, mm -hmm. So now my central interest and involvement is really uh, in the violence prevention area and looking and looking at evaluations, trying to summarize again, summarize what the research shows about uh, which kinds of programs are effective and which kind of programs are not effective and promoting those kinds of programs which led to the development of the Blueprints for Violence mm -hmm. Prevention Initiative. How long has the Blueprints program been going on now? Blueprints, uh, we started Blueprints in 1996. Mm -hmm. um, and we are funded through um, 2016. Um, and the Blueprints Initiative is undergoing a major expansion. I mean, you know, really, we started off just looking at violence, drug, and delinquency prevention programs. Um, we now are expanding into mental health, so we're looking at suicide, depression, uh, and a couple of the affective disorders. Um, we are moving into uh, academic. Uh, success outcomes uh, and emotional well, other indicators of emotional well-being, self-regulation, and um, other kinds of outcomes. As a part of a, a big Casey, NE Casey initiative, which is called Evidence to Success. Mm -hmm. um, so we're essentially 
uh, the part of that initiative which does looks for good programs, certifies programs as meeting a very high standard of scientific evidence for their effectiveness um, and promoting those programs as mm -hmm. programs that work. Um, we're expanding the kind of information you can get. So on our website soon you'll be able to get cost uh, benefit information for a program, give you a range of what you can expect. Um, a, a calculation of Monte Carlo, a calculation of what the odds are that you'll get a, an effect which is uh, greater than zero. Okay. Um, readiness ratings, to how ready a program is to be disseminated or if it's already being disseminated widely. Information on funding, where the basic funding sources are for a given program. So we're really developing a very, I think, very broad, useful kinds of information for somebody who's looking for an effective program. So for a state uh, government or for a private foundation or uh, you know, an agency that's looking uh, for uh, implementing a program that they can count on as being effective, I think this will give those kinds of people the kind of information they would need to make that decision. Does it feel like this is taking you a long ways from um, the field you were in to start with, or that it's been a way to help shape and redirect the field? That's Both? A, <laughs> yeah, that's a great question because, you know, it wasn't too long ago when, you know, Martinson and Seacrest and uh, Lipsy yeah. and, um, were saying there wasn't anything we could show worked. Right. Um, and I really believe that the reason we are now in a position where we can say, here are some things that work. I mean, right. we've got a long ways to go, don't misunderstand me. But we, we can say that there are a number of programs we can show that look like they, that they work, that all have relatively modest effects. I don't think we should, uh, we should overstate uh, our, our success in, in being able to intervene. Uh, either in a prevention program or in an intervention or treatment program. But, but we can say here's some programs that do have some modest effects. And, and those modest effects translate into huge dollar savings when you think of uh -huh. these systems that, are, that, that kids are going in um, across the country. Um, lost my train of where I was going there, but... Well, that's fascinating. The question, ask, About, remind me the question. Um, the sort of the distance from oh, yeah. terminology has started right. and effect right. on the field going forward. Right, so what, what I think happened from the time we were saying we couldn't demonstrate anything mm -hmm. that worked to the time we're now saying, okay, we've got some things that work, was a huge increase in longitudinal studies and the ability to actually look at the predictive power of risk or protective factors as we call them now and, and how strong they were or to what extent they were able to predict uh, particular outcomes. So I see the development, both uh, theoretical development, longitudinal studies, and, and better, much better methodology, mm -hmm. leading to a better body of knowledge about the antecedents and, and modifiers that are involved in producing these negative outcomes that we're studying. And those are the things which are being developed and utilized in the successful intervention programs. Mm -hmm. So if you look, if you look at MST, uh, excuse me, multi-systemic therapy as a program, you can see that a lot of the, some of the research I did, some of the research you did mm -hmm. is cited as a part of the development of that intervention strategy. So I do think yeah. these things are very directly tied mm -hmm. and as the quality of our basic research improved, we were starting then to be able to develop interventions which were successful. Very good. Um, what contributions do you look back on with the most pride? Hmm. Um, I think one of them that I look back on um, was when I agreed to become the science editor for the Surgeon General's report on youth violence. Um, I turned it down twice when I was asked um, <laughs> I didn't because know. I thought it was a major distraction from the things that I was doing. Uh, then David Satcher called me, he was the Surgeon General at the time, and talked to me about what he envisioned for 
that report. Um, and it was, there were some special limitations for that report. One, there was going to be less than a year before that report was delivered. He already had a commitment from, to the Congress to deliver that report um, by January 2001. Um, and so there was very little time. So that was one of the things that concerned me. It wasn't gonna, we weren't going to be able to develop this report in the way that earlier reports had been developed where you, you actually commission different people oh, yeah. to write particular chapters or particular sections um, and then you just edited yeah, right. those. Um, it turns out that there wasn't time to do that. So on the one hand, I saw that as a real disadvantage. On the other hand, it gave me a lot more influence over what was going to be in the report because I essentially um, essentially outlined that report, laid out all of that report, and largely you know, directed uh, the writing uh, for that entire report. Um, so that, for me, um, offered a special opportunity, and I, I, I took on that task. And, and that was another major learning experience for me. I had a big advisory board that I had to report to, which included, again, these are people now in, that are involved in a more practical world inside of this, uh, as well as the people from the agency. So obviously this is HHS, CDC, was directly involved in it, and IMH was directly involved. All of these agencies had input into that outline and essentially had to approve that step by step as we went along. So we had meetings with that advisory board, some good, really good meetings, uh, which I think again broadened my perspective um, you know, on the things that are really important mm -hmm. out of this field. Um, so writing the Surgeon General's report and the editing on the Surgeon General's report um, was a, a major accomplishment, which I was, it was, it was a tough task. Yeah, it's not like it. Uh, but we met, we met the deadline. Mm -hmm. um, I had the opportunity to go with um, the Surgeon General um, to visit the, the congressional offices that he was accountable to and reported, sat in. Was able to sit in and listen to the dialogue there as that report was delivered, and um, there was some negative reaction to it on the part of some senators. Um, and uh, but to go through all of that, be exposed at that level of uh, interest in in our country on this question around youth violence was a great experience. Any other things on your list uh, things you're most proud of? Um, well, I'm, I'm proud of the body of research that, um, that, that I helped to develop. Um, I'm proud of the, um, a lot of the initial work that I did around measuring self-reported delinquency. Mm -hmm. um, this was at the time that I started. Uh, we had some um, some early, you know, Short, of course, was involved, uh, James Short was involved earlier, and, and Marty Gold had developed earlier measures, but I think I really developed um, a more comprehensive set of uh, measures of, of uh, self-reported delinquency. Some of the things that, that we developed are, I, I've not seen uh, been followed up on, um, but, but in our measure, you know, we measured it a couple of ways. We mm -hmm. measured it in, in uh, in a way in which you got a continuous measure, mm -hmm. uh, and then we measured it um, in a way in which you use uh, categories, which really provide a, a very different kind of distribution. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of arguments that we had around uh, when we were doing the analyses, whether we'd use that continuous measure or we would use the, the more truncated measure. And the concern was, as you know, that um, on, the, on the continuous measure, it's a very skewed distribution. Um, and you have this tail out here with kids who report hundreds of offenses in a given year. Mm -hmm. And when you use one of these uh, categorical uh, once, two or three times, four or more times, you miss all of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're lumping kids that, you know, commit four relatively minor offenses with kids that are involved in 10 or 15 felony assaults in a given year. So that was a concern to us. But a lot of the advice I got from methodologists was that we should essentially truncate the distribution mm -hmm. and cut those off, either cut them off and abandon them, or, but 
for me, those were the kids that were of the most interest. Yeah. And so we developed some, in our National Youth Survey, we developed some ways of trying to determine whether those were valid responses, whether they were measuring real behavior, or whether the kids were just, you know, giving us, uh, you know, pulling our leg mm -hmm. about that. So we had, we started asking, okay, we want you to tell us about the last yeah, three events. Right. You know, so our measure was, you know, how often have you done this? Uh, and then we got a measure to try to determine whether this was something that typically happened once a month or typically happened two times a year or happened on a daily basis. And then we asked about the last three events. And on the basis of that, we were able to identify, it wasn't too hard to be able to identify kids who are making things up. Mm -hmm. And so we have a, a way in that measure to correct for mm -hmm. that particular kind of, of a response uh, that, that kids are making. Um, so we've done a lot of work around trying to validate uh, right. the self-reported measures. And I, you know, some of that work is not well known, um, but um, I think it was important work. We, our measures, the basic measure is still being used. Oh, a yeah, lot. a lot. But um, a lot of these things we added on to improve right. the quality of the data you get from those measures. Um, is not being used, and I understand why. It's a new. It, it, it adds to the response burden right. uh, for um, the, the people who are taking those uh, surveys and, and using those measures. But we found it useful to make some correction on our self-reported mm -hmm. measures based upon those kinds of things. Right. Well, it's fascinating to have that extra level of detail. Um, I see some every once in a while someone will start dig into that and come up with some interesting, I mean, it's a lot w worthwhile to know just from not just, okay, 15 assaults or whatever, but what did they tell us about those assaults, how do they work? Right. That I think is an important opportunity missed. And some of the things that came out of that that I think were important was there's, there's this question about in self-reported data, we don't see the big race differences that we see in official right. data. And the question is, is that an artifact of the self-reporting or is that it, is it is it equally valid as a measure for African Americans, whites, and Hispanics? Mm -hmm. So our analysis of looking at those follow-up questions right. tells us it is that we don't see um, you know the, the African Americans underreporting um, when we are not finding the, the big differences we see in official data. So I, I, I have a lot of confidence in the self-reported measures. It does have its limitations, mm -hmm. but so do official measures. Um, and so, you know, in most of the work we do, uh, we use both because we think they reflect somewhat different things. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess I think that the contributions I made to uh, self-reported delinquency were another one of the things I, I look back upon just thinking I made a significant contribution. Yeah. I do too. Um, question I have here, I think it is an interesting theme. How has the work mentioned endured the criticism it's received? Just in general, in your experience, how has the process of exchange with others reacting to your work, agreeing, disagreeing, um, how has that been? Have, um, have you? enjoyed that, felt like it's been fair, felt like um, it's uh, a distraction for, uh, or hmm. a benefit? Um, I think it's all of those things. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the, the, the early uh, distraction, the, the early kind of real serious criticism I got was over integrated theory. And Travis Hershey was really unhappy with, uh, you know, with that formulation. So we did have uh, an exchange, mm -hmm. um, which, which I thought was a good exchange and helpful. Um, and I think it, it allowed me to, to improve and to make uh, some changes and modifications to, uh, to the way that we formulated that theory. Um, so on the one hand, the first time you see that kind of a criticism of your work, it's, it is a little distracting and it is a little hard to take. But the interesting thing about that with me is that, that we, we were good friends. 
Mm -hmm. And so even though we had pretty sharp exchanges um, in the literature, um, you know, I really respect Travis and his work. Um, and so we, we got along well on that level. And that, I think, was important for me. If, the, if we'd lost that, then it would have been a much more tragic thing. But we were able to disagree um, on, on some pretty fundamental things um, and still uh, keep our, our collegial relationship a, a positive one. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, a lot of the early criticism on interaction theory, uh, excuse me, on integrated theory, um, I thought was not well informed. Um, you know, some of the early criticism said we hadn't paid attention to the underlying assumptions that had to be m modified in some way to combine uh, uh, control theory with mm -hmm. learning theory and with strain theory because they all come with different basic assumptions. And that always surprised me because I, that was a major part of what I thought we did was we did change and, and, and gave a justification for changing particularly one of the assumptions out of control theory which would allow us to do this integration. And, and our form of integration was a propositional mm -hmm. integration. It was an integration of, of propositional statements, not absorption, like a lot of people are talking about integrated theory today and they're just talking about, well, this concept is really the same concept and it's what you're using over there. So we can, we can merge those two mm -hmm. concepts, is what Akers calls absorption. Uh, so I thought that some of the criticism came from people who didn't read the statement very carefully, uh, in which case I just ignored it. <laughs> in other cases, I think there were valid issues that were raised that we had to address. Mm -hmm. So in the long run, I think um, that having that kind of exchange and discourse is very positive and leads to better work. Mm -hmm. Switching gears a little bit, um, would you have done anything differently if you were beginning again? In terms of my career or in terms of, <laughs> yes. I, I look back on my fathering and there are some things I wish I could do differently. Um, you know, I guess um, I can't think of any kind of major things that I think I would do differently from on the basis of what I know now. Uh, at the time, um, you know, very close to Dick Jesser, for example, who I'm close to, told me it was a mistake for me to take on the, doing the Surgeon General's report. And so for a while, I wasn't sure whether that had been, <laughs> whether that had been a good thing. But looking back on it now, I, I think it was a real positive thing for me, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for my own, own career. So I guess- well, let it it reshaped your career quite a bit. It did. It, it was a part of this move out of basic ideological kinds of work into more practical applied work. Right. Um, and it was a part of that transition that was going on in my life. Um, so that now almost all of my work is really on the, on the blueprints. I mean, that's mm -hmm. primarily where my time is now, is on, on developing um, and I've had to learn a lot about methods. Um, mm. And again, we're into, now that we're into mental health outcomes, whole different kinds of methodologies which are involved as compared to what criminologists are, are doing. Um, and we're looking at a lot of what economists are doing mm -hmm. uh, and some methods there that they use, which, you know, I've never heard of. So, you know, we learned about, was it uh, Uber White? Um, mm -hmm. As an alternative to HLM, I mean, I thought HLM was the, you know, catch the answer, to was the answer right. to everything. All the, the ability to look at at the influence of uh, you know different contexts, you know, a very simple adjustment that you make to the standard error based upon mm -hmm. the interclass correlation, and so it's still an ongoing learning process. And as we are expanding um, the areas that we're uh, looking at for effective interventions has 
demand a new learning, new uh, you know understanding, uh, even in this fairly narrow area of uh, experimental mm -hmm. studies and experimental design. Right. But I love it. I, I'm I find this really exciting kinds of uh, work to do. Do you have any advice for uh, young scholars as they launch their careers? Well, as I look at, at back on my career, as I said before, one of the major positive things I did was to get involved um, you know, with the federal agency, in my case it was NIMH, on those review panels. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I would recommend to, to new uh, research scholars is to get involved on in something like that. Um, you know, where it puts you right on the front of research, you, you, it, it shows you and teaches you what kinds of things are happening in the, in the, in the research world, and it, in, it improves your skills uh, in, I think, some important ways. It also established some friendships and some networks mm -hmm. which are still there and strong today. So the people that I worked with on that early, uh, yeah. the panel I did, are still close friends. Mm -hmm. Something kind of beyond the, the questions we're working from, from what I know about your career and work, um, you had an independent research entity for a good while, left the faculty, a regular faculty position. Mm -hmm. And um, and that, I think, grew out of just getting a big research operation going. And you. Uh, in that sense, and you've kept that going even though it came back to the university at some point, your career is rather different than a lot of folks in that um, it was your time commitment to the standard academic job was mixed with um, the time commitment to running a pretty large research operation. How do you think that, uh, what, what was that like and how does that make your career different than some other folks? Well, I, I think I was very fortunate because when I left uh, San Diego State and came to the University of Colorado, I, I had a very unique position. Um, I had a position which was a guaranteed half-time research position. So I had a joint appointment in the Institute of Behavioral Sciences and in the Department of Sociology. So my teaching load in the Department of Sociology was never more than a half load. So one course a semester. So. That gave me a huge advantage. Um, so I had a research position. Um, so whether I had a grant or didn't have a grant, uh, I had half time to work on my research. Turns out I had that there. Uh, I was never without a grant. Mm -hmm. right. uh, I mean, I've had. Uh, I've always had grants uh, for my entire professional career. Um, so I was been. I've been very uh, fortunate in, in that respect. Um, but that does mean that my career probably is a little different than a lot of uh, young, uh, new scholars, researchers who are coming out who, who have to try to write grants while they're carrying full loads. Uh, and and I, that's got to be hard. And, and I never was really in that position. Um, so, but there are a couple things to say about that. One. Um, running a big research organization um, carries a, a, a heavy administrative responsibility as well. Um, and there are times when that's burdensome. Um, so I'm not sure I would recommend that, um, that you take on that kind of responsibility of trying to you know, to set up an, an essentially a center or, you know, a big uh, kind of research operation because that does become a distraction from what, where my, you know, I've always, in my whole career, I've always gone through with, t with a division of work, my work and the work for the program. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's hard to get to my work because of the administrative responsibilities that I carry for you know, having a large a center organization. Um, so there are some positive things about that. Um, able to attract um, a group of researchers who are excellent in their skills, 
um, and to create a, a kind of an environment where you have colleagues that you can talk to about the specific things you're working on and you share those interests. And I know that many people in academic departments don't have that. I mean, you know, maybe another criminologist, one other criminologist there, and you may not share the same kind of interest. So that's a facilitating, creating an intellectual environment that really does facilitate, I think, writing, research, scholarship, all of those things. Um, so that's the plus side of it. Um, the downside is the, the administrative work, hand, handling personnel problems. So even though I, I was, um, you know, had a half-time research appointment, for all practical purposes, I had the responsibilities of a departmental chairman. Right. managing 20 or 30 people mm -hmm. uh, with all of those uh, kinds of issues and problems. Um, so I looked forward to retirement as a time <laughs> in Having which... Been retired seven years old. Yeah, <laughs> as a time in which I could write. Mm -hmm. Because I've all, I mean, I've, I just find it hard to get the time to write. Mm -hmm. And so far in my retirement, it hasn't worked out that way. <laughs> well. Maybe we'll get it sorted out this next I, year. You know, if I get one article, I get about one article a year now, and that's that's all I have time to do. So. Um, let's finish up with your general thoughts on the state of the field of criminology, and any thoughts about directions that we should be giving more attention to. You know, I, I really feel that over my career, I've seen major changes in the way that criminology has grown and developed and where they were going. Um, early on, um, people who were involved in, the, in this practice side of it, that is the research contributing to practice, were really looked down upon. And it was action sociology. Mm -hmm. That's what they called it. Uh, and that was kind of a stepchild within criminology, if you were involved uh, in that. That was too close to social work. Um, that's changed. I mean, I'm amazed to see how much of the research going on today at this meeting and meetings is really devoted to this prevention, intervention, what works um, side of our field, to the applied side of our knowledge uh, about the uh, etiology, epidemiology of, of crime. So that's a huge change. Um, and there have been huge changes in the sophistication and the, in the methodology. I mean, we've had major developments. There were times that I worried that we were losing the theoretical focus. And I still feel that we haven't seen real progress theoretically. Um, the life course developmental paradigm, I think, has, has proven to provide a whole new rich way of thinking about theory. It's changed our focus from onset of crime to looking at onset, trajectories, termination, mm -hmm. a whole set of other things which come out of the criminal career paradigm. So I think those are kind of the, the new directions we're going and the most recent things that I see are the, the focus trying to understand termination which is really important when we think about the applied side of this and working with you know, adolescents or um, adults who get caught up in crime. And, uh, and the question is, you know, how, how can we intervene in a way to bring about a successful termination of their involvement in that kind of behavior? And that requires knowledge about termination because it's pretty clear at this point that those conditions which lead one into involvement in criminal behavior aren't necessarily the same things that are related to their terminating environment. Yeah. Because it typically happens at a different stage of the life course, it typically involves different settings and different right. circumstances. So I think that the future development of, of the intervention work that you know we're looking at would be greatly enhanced by better research on termination. And I see that happening. I don't see that that particular area well developed yet. Great. Well, it's been wonderful talking to you, Del. Thank you, Wayne. It's been wonderful talking with you.